Okay, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the guests joining us here in the Nelson Mears Foundation Auditorium of the Chow Shack Wing Museum. And for those of you, those of you joining us via Zoom, um, my name is Craig Barker. Um, and before I begin talking about this afternoon's presentation, I will start off by um, firstly just acknowledging that the University of Sydney and the Chow Chak Wing Museum is built on the lands of the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. Uh, the Chow Chak Wing Museum uh, wishes to uh, acknowledge the traditional owners and we pay our respect to uh, elders both past and present. We've done a lot of work with this museum for those of you in the room who've had a chance to have a look around to work with local community in terms of trying to tell Gadigal stories. And I hope you can join us in future for more and more events and uh, forums where we can discuss the role of Gadigal culture and broader culture of the Sydney based peoples um, in terms of both historic, but also contemporary stories as well. Um, as I said before, whoops, got too many different things open. As I said before, my name's Craig Barker. I am the head of public engagement here at the Chow Chak Wing Museum, and I'm also an archeologist. Um, and I'm also an archeologist who is very fortunate that I have something of a, a, a media platform. You can argue as to how big or not that is. And so uh, what I wanted to do today was to talk a little bit about how archeology span and the media have engaged over time and to kind of give a live, version of the Can You Dig It uh, radio segment that I'm involved with as well. Um, normally, uh, and I should actually uh, preempt talking about anything by saying that it is, of course, National Archaeology Week. Today is the, the last day. We've had an incredibly busy schedule of events right across Australia. Um, and if anyone didn't have a chance to see things that were taking place, many of them have been recorded and are available through archaeologyweek.org, the website, which is the, uh, the central organising area of all of the National Archaeology Week um, events. But we at the Chow Chak Wing Museum, this is now talk number eight in the series, and I've introduced all of them apart from one. Um, so it's slightly odd introducing yourself, I've just realised, but uh, um, to uh, give you a very brief pre um, as I said before, I'm the head of public engagement, but I am a, a classical archaeologist um, and a Cypriot archaeologist here at the University of Sydney. During my career, I've been incredibly fortunate to have worked on excavations both here in Australia and in pre-COVID times in places such as Greece and Turkey and Cyprus. I am the director of the Paphos Theatre Archaeological Project in Cyprus, which is a, a long-term research excavation of an ancient theatre, Hellenistic and Roman period. Um, and uh, in, in a post-COVID world, we are aiming to return to that site. I've uh, lectured a, a number of courses here at the university in different aspects of archaeology. Um, and of course, my role here at the Chow Chak Wing Museum is very heavily involved in terms of public outreach, the school education programs, adult education programs, and the series of talks that we've been uh, organizing for this year as well. Um, and as I said before, it's completely inadvertently, I've ended up with something of a, of a media uh, profile as well. So what I wanted to discuss today was kind of the relationship between archeology span and media, and then kind of present some of the current archeology span news stories that have taken place over the past couple of weeks, some of which you may have heard, some of which you may have missed, um, which is a relatively regular feature of the Can You Dig It segment. Now, Can You Dig It, for those of you who are unaware, is a segment on Sunday evenings on ABC Radio, so here in Sydney on 702, um, but of course it is uh, broadcast right across Australia through ABC's radio, local radio network. And I've been appearing once a month uh, since uh, the beginning of 2016. And how this came about was actually from the Sunday evening's host at that point in time, Rihanna uh, Patrick. I was giving a uh, lecture at the University of Queensland, a public lecture on the work in Cyprus. And uh, after finishing, the woman bounded up at me and thrust her business card at me and said, Craig, 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 I'd love to talk to you. I'd love to talk to you. Can, can you send me an email when you're back in Sydney? I said, of course I can. Not, of course, knowing Rihanna's uh, involvement with, uh, with radio, but basically what she was scouting for was someone who could fulfill 
a segment such as uh, as Can You Dig It Evolved. So uh, um, she and I had uh, uh, long conversations about what she wanted the program to try and achieve. Um, my first appearance was a, quite a simple one to talk about the Paphos Feeder Archaeological Project. I guess that was my or, you know, my audition tape. And uh, she then got me in over seven months initially to talk about one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. Uh, my uh, probationary period, I guess, looking back upon it. And I obviously passed because I'm still there. Um, and what's been lovely was that what Rihanna wanted to do with this segment was to, to bring a deep dive discussion about some various topics associated with ancient world studies or archaeology, both here in Australia or abroad. But at that point in time, the program also went for an hour. So the concept was to then do half an hour's deep dive on a topic of the week and uh, or of the month, and then half an hour examining some of the key news stories, which is what I want to kind of replicate this afternoon a little bit later on. So it's great because I found myself becoming quite a regular fixture at ABC Ultimo in a pre-COVID period. Um, and some of you in the room and some of you online may have actually had the, uh, the privilege of actually appearing on you know, one of the programs, either at the ABC or one of the other broadcasters. Um, but uh, in, in terms of ABC Radio, they have these tiny little studios, tiny little studios. So Rihanna's based in, uh, or what at that time was based in um, Brisbane. And uh, uh, I was here in Sydney at Ultimo, um, appearing in one of what the ABC called a TARDIS. Now, unlike the proper TARDIS, the ABC TARDIS, is, and I think this is perhaps reflective of ABC budgets, is definitely smaller on the inside. So you find yourselves in these tiny, tiny little rooms. And of course, again, um, periodically I would have guests on to help me cover a topic and you'd find yourself, the more guests, the tighter it got. So obviously uh, no chance of 1.5 metres socially distance, distancing within the ABC TARDISes. Um, the blue police box one you probably could, but uh, not on radio. But I found myself uh, making the pilgrimage into uh, uh, Ultimo uh, one Sunday night a week, uh, a month rather, um, over the years, and we talked about different topics. Rihanna and I have gone on to become firm friends, and uh, what's actually happened is that uh, uh, in the middle of 2020, Rihanna actually left the ABC and is now working for an organisation called Indigenous X. Now, if you're not aware of the work of Indigenous X, I would suggest that anyone who's listening to this conversation um, you know, jump online and have a look at the work that they are doing we are on the brink of a revolution in terms of the way that the Australian media reports on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander issues and affairs. And Indigenous X is going to be at the forefront of that revolution, a chance for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people to actually present their own voices. So it's very, very exciting seeing what Rihanna is doing. And what's lovely is that, um, you know, the program could have very easily finished when Rihanna left, but um, the ABC producers and the ABC team have decided to keep on going. So Rihanna's replacement on Sunday nights is the comedian Craig Quartermain. And Craig and I, it's a bit confusing. Hello, Craig. Hello, Craig. Hi, Craig. How are you, Craig? Um, but we've continued the, the program on into this year. The format, if any of you have listened, has changed a little bit in 2021 um, in line with broader ABC policy that uh, programs are no longer an hour, but half an hour. Um, and so what we're finding this year is that we will some months do a deep dive into a particular topic and in other months we'll do a summary of news as well. So we've kind of split it up a little bit in terms of how we used to do it in the old days. But um, again, it's a really exciting um, uh, opportunity to present some discussions in terms of historical studies and archaeological studies to a much larger audience than we could you know, preaching from the university. And What's also been exciting about it is that over the five years now that I've been on the program, both Rihanna and Craig have been so welcoming in terms of me having an idea for a topic or me having an idea for a guest to come on. I obviously ran out of things I could talk about easily or after about month eight, I would have thought. Um, so what was nice was to actually bring in other voices. And what I wanted to do with this segment while ever it lasted was to try and amplify and promote some really interesting research being done by Australians in the field of archaeology and ancient world studies. The whole aim of National Archaeology Week was to promote the idea of 
what's happening here in this country in terms of both Indigenous and historical period archaeology, but also the work being done by Australian archaeologists overseas. And I kind of felt that the, the, the radio segment, uh, while ever the listeners were, were, were able to go on the journey with us, would be a great way for us to, to continue that idea of promoting the fact that it's actually Australians at the forefront of a whole lot of really interesting research questions. And also, rather interestingly, how the way that those of us who work within the sector in this country have been able to etch out our various careers and our various aspects of uh, research. Um, you know, the interesting thing that often uh, many of the uh, archaeologists in this country will work commercially for a consultancy firm, but then in their holidays will go and work in an excavation like Pella or Paphos or Zagora. And this really interesting dichotomy of how if we're trained well, the processes that we follow should be applicable irrespective of whether we're working on Australian material or material culture from South America or material culture for Europe, from Europe. So uh, if, you, if you go back, and I think this is another sign of, uh, and I hope no one's listening, but I think this is another sign of ABC Budget Cuts because the, uh, the podcast uh, webpage is not completely up to date. But uh, if, you, if you do actually go to the ABC's website, you'll see that there's a full range of different topics that we've covered over the five years. Both myself and guests, you'll see Irving Finkel from the British Museum. I've had uh, Dr. Estelle Laser, well known to anyone who's studied Pompeii here in Australia. Uh, only last week uh, to promote National Archaeology Week, um, our colleague here at the Department of Archaeology, Dr. James Flexner, joined me as the Nagari Richards, who's a consultant archaeologist. And so what's been really lovely is just being able to bring in a whole lot of different voices. Interestingly, when Rihanna was, was the host, and we, we'd have lots of conversations, but what I, what I discovered very quickly was that Rihanna um, uh, was, was very keen to find any way to work archaeology into her particular passions, which tended to be Doctor Who, tick, safe there, don't need to think. Um, so hence the Tata stroke too, by the way. Um, aviation history, which believe it or not, there is actually a very interesting connection between archaeological research and aviation history, both in terms of aerial archaeology, aerial recording of archaeological sites, initially through photography from the 1920s onwards, and indeed 2021 is the uh, centenary of, uh, of uh, Crawford um, establishing the Royal um, uh, Ordnance uh, Society. Um, and one of the things that they charted was this idea of let's bring the cutting edge technology of World War I of aerial photography to archaeological research to understand historical Britain. So there's that. But then, you know, interestingly, in the last decade or so, a whole lot of excavations of plane wreck sites and so on as well. And there is actually an aviation history uh, organisation here in Australia that holds an annual conference that actually has a section each uh, year, which is quite specifically devoted to aviation archaeology. So we managed to find some really common ground there. Um, and uh, Rihanna was also, of course, a, a great lover of, um, of uh, British history and British culture. So I'd find myself sort of with news stories going, well, Rihanna, should we talk about the new rock art from Kimberley's? And, and Rihanna would always say, ah, oh, nah, let's do the story about an uh, Anglo-Saxon site in Devon instead. So again, it was really interesting and I was given a real sense of freedom by both of the hosts in terms of what stories we could choose. Um, and uh, sometimes we were quite ambitious. We'd try and cover sort of seven or eight news stories in a half hour segment. Sometimes we would deep dive into one or two stories as well. Um, and often it was fly by the seat of your pants as well, like all live radio. Um, the number of times that we've had dropouts, particularly in uh, the, the COVID lockdown period, which continues to today, that the ABC is trying to reduce the number of uh, guests and uh, people uh, working on the premises. And so they use this incredible app called Report IT, which works probably 40% of the time. And so the number of times I've been dropping out, and there was one segment where we just had to give up and uh, Rihanna ended up in, uh, in, um, uh, interviewing her uh, radio producer in Brisbane about her pet cat, whereas I'm on the other end of the line in Sydney listening to it going, oh, well. And rather sadly, of course, that was a segment we dedicated quite specifically. It was around the time of the statues being torn down with the Black Lives Matter. And so we'd built this really um, detailed program exploring some of the issues associated with 
repatriation and decolonizing archaeology and decolonizing museums. So we managed to revisit that in a future episode. But uh, yes, I found myself talking to dead air for some time. And I think the good listeners around Australia certainly weren't listening to me. Um, so it, it, it was challenging at times. Um, I, I, in one year, I lost my voice for a number of months. And so I would sort of squawk my way for a program. And uh, every now and then they'd play a song to let me rest and have some water. But it was always enjoyable and has always continued to be enjoyable. I'm just one small cog in a much bigger wheel, which has been going for some time in this really interesting relationship between the way archaeology presents itself in the media and the way the media wants to present archaeology. And in some cases, such as a segment like Can You Dig It, it works incredibly well. In other cases, the relationship could be quite fractured and torturous. And so what I'd like to do is just to take a couple of minutes and to actually explore a little bit of the history of how the media and archaeology have engaged well and when they haven't done it quite well at all. Archaeology has always, of course, been a visual subject and therefore has attracted TV crews right from a very early day. And I'm going to talk to you about Howard Carter and Tutankhamun in just one moment. But um, particularly in Britain, more so than here in Australia, there's actually a long tradition of public archaeology on television. Um, I'll come and talk about radio in a moment, but archaeology courses is an incredibly visual media. We are dealing with material culture, we're dealing with materiality, we are dealing with sites. Um, and one of the things you only have to watch any historical documentary on SBS on a Sunday night now to get a sense of how much things like virtual reality, uh, uh, computer graphics and uh, CGI and uh, CAD drawing models are being incorporated into that type of documentary making. But in the very early days of television, what you often had in terms of archaeology was a very distinguished, almost exclusively male and always white academic giving a lecture. And uh, a number of these are actually available online in various places. Many of them are on the BBC iPlayer uh, network and so are not quite so easy for us to watch in Australia. But those that are are truly quite fascinating to watch. And one I would recommend, which a number of episodes are available on YouTube, was the quiz show of 1956 on the BBC called Animal, Mineral, Vegetable. The concept of this program was that three distinguished archaeologists Again, as you can see from the image, diversity was not a consideration in any way, shape or form. But uh, three distinguished archaeologists would be brought into the BBC's studio and an object or a series of objects passed around in which they would discuss and debate which object it was. So in this image, you will see some three very, very, very distinguished archaeologists in terms of mid-century, mid-20th century um, archaeology in Britain and in many ways the pioneers of the concept of public archaeology from the British perspective. On the left is Sir Mortimer Wheeler. In the middle is Glenn Daniels and closest to me on the right is Via Gordon Child, the Australian graduate of the University of Sydney here um, and this was filmed only a number of years before he died here in, um, here in the Blue Mountains. What you've got is the three of them debating the objects. And when I talk about diversity, what's interesting watching them today through the, through the lens of you know, almost 70 years is A, actually how well it still stands up, um, but B, also how very much a product of its time it was. That all of the academics were talking with that very, very Oxbridge accent, with one exception. Now, Gordon Child is, a, is someone whose work I've read for 25 years, you know, again, he's rightly revered in archaeology circles, even if many of his theories are no longer held as to being uh, uh, an, an, an accurate interpretation of the data. Um, he is without doubt the most influential figure in world archaeology that Australia has ever produced. He should be much more celebrated in this country. Uh, there was a biography of him published last year because as well as his career in archaeology, he was a committed Marxist and quite heavily influential in labour uh, politics here in Australia, particularly in World War I period before he moved to the UK. At one stage, he worked for the New South Wales government, um, which would be inconceivable today to have someone of his political views. But what's 
fascinating is that until I watched this and I, I, I heard some interviews with him on the radio recorded around the same time, I was blissfully unaware of how much his broad Australian accent he kept with him for the rest of his life. And so it's kind of interesting that you do have these very Oxbridge voices and then suddenly a bit of a twang come in as well. But what's fascinating about it was actually just how, what a basic concept, three guys sitting around talking about an ancient pot is actually quite riveting television if done well. And in many ways, it was also about the personalities. Now, Mortimer Wheeler is an interesting character in a whole set of reasons, which I don't have time to go into today, but he was certainly charismatic. Um, and uh, even with that moustache, believe it or not. Um, and what's quite extraordinary was that he was actually voted BBC's television personality of the year, not once, not twice, but three times. Um, so really quite extraordinary to think that, you know, this very straight laced lecturer, you know, delivering a relatively formal lecture was actually engaged with by an audience of millions of Britons throughout the 1950s and early 1960s. Um, a number of his Swan Hellenic tours of various parts of Europe and the Mediterranean were actually filmed and televised, for example, as well. And he really pioneered the idea of archaeological broadcasting. But um, but again, and, and by the way, there was also at the time much rumour and innuendo among his colleagues because Mortimer Wheeler would normally win animal, mineral, vegetable. But there was much comment that supposedly he would phone the museums around Britain before appearing on the show just to make inquiries about, oh, are there any objects that have been taken off display this week? Um, now, it's, it's incredibly unlikely he did this. Um, I, I doubt he would have had time to, but uh, uh, it does give you a, a sense of just how much he dominated the media outreach. And I guess what I'm trying to say is that, that it, it's been a long journey in terms of the way that archaeology has been presented in the media from that post-war period through to something like Time Team that I'm sure is known and loved by everybody in this program. Time team as a concept is not without its problems, but what it did do was to bring to uh, predominantly a British audience, but obviously a much wider international audience, including here in Australia, um, the concept of excavation and more importantly, the various processes of excavation. Why they kept with the myth that they were only digging for three days uh, for two decades, I've never quite understood because everyone knew it wasn't true. But nonetheless, what was interesting was getting the processes of excavation filmed in a manner in which experts could calmly describe what they're doing. Um, and fans will be pleased to know that due to a crowdfunding uh, program over the uh, COVID lockdown period, there have actually been a number of uh, specials filmed that will go to air this year. The most recent addition to this concept, whoops, Oh, I've, sorry, it hasn't saved. There's a, a, another program which has just aired in Britain, yet to be seen here in Australia. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, I've completely forgotten the name of it. Um, but, oh yeah, sorry, Can You Dig It? Uh, no, no, that's my program. It was a, the Great British Dig, that's what it is. So I suspect that it's a, a twist on the, uh, the Bake Off idea. And of course, fans of reality television will know that there's been a whole lot of sewing programs and painting programs. This is the archaeology version of the concept of of, the, of the, 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 the baking show. So that's one end of the spectrum. And of course, what you'll see gradually is a little bit more diversity coming in, although the argument can certainly be made that archaeology as a discipline has a long, 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 long way to go. But at least we were getting female voices and we were getting voices of working class archaeologists and we're certainly getting a lot of bad facial hair as well. Um, that generation of 1970s and 1980s archaeologists. Contrast that with what was happening at the other end of the media outreach spectrum, particularly with American uh, uh, networks and, and in particular the Discovery Channel. So um, Hunting Atlantis, which will go to air in the United States next month, um, has literally erupted on Twitter over the past couple of weeks about why are we perpetuating this myth that there might well be a, an Atlantis out there when the generally universally accepted opinion historically and archaeologically is that Plato created a concept of a city for the morality of the story that he was telling. The other one, and I've had the misfortune of seeing one episode of it, and I 
swore I never would again, was uh, the Discovery Channel's program hosted by Megan Fox, who I've subsequently discovered is also an anti-vaxxer, um, called Legends of the Lost. And the less said about that, probably the better. So I'll move on to the next slide. But you can see that there is a sensationalist aspect on some program. How do you find the balance between a dry academic lecture delivered by Sir Mortimer Wheeler and this Hollywoodization of documentary production? Oh, sorry, there it is, The Great British Dick. That's the one. Now, that's television. I'm talking about radio today. And so from a different contrast, how do you present a very visual media within a format such as radio? Again, here, I think the British have really led the, 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 the path forward. Um, because there is such a long tradition of public broadcasting there as well. But um, you, you do have scenarios, again, dating right back to the, well, indeed, actually right back to the 1930s of archaeologists delivering lectures on radio. And what is interesting, again, going back and hearing some of those older ones, is the way that the language has changed. If you can't see the slide, how does the presenter describe the object or the site or the plan that they are presenting for one thing. And that's one of the great challenges of radio, that of course you actually have the ability to talk more than you do on television or in print media, but you have to use very different language to describe what it is that you're wanting your audience to see in their mind. There's also been a number of really interesting concepts in terms of the way that archeological material could be presented within the radio. And I present from 2010, the then director of the British Museum, Neil McGregor's um, series of 15 minute segments, 115 minute segments called A History of the World in 100 Objects. Now this at the time, and bear in mind 2010 is just the beginning of the podcast revolution as well. And so this program was effectively designed not to be listened live, but to be listened as a podcast at the luxury of your own time, driving your car, putting your kids down in the shower, whatever. And what was interesting about this was that it led to an exhibition, it led to a best-selling book, it led to pretty much every other museum on the planet developing some sort of 20 objects, 50 treasures, a thousand objects. And of course, given the broader debates within archaeology, heritage and museums over the past decade anyway, in terms of decolonization, repatriation and so on, has also led to a lot of comment about how in many ways this represented the end of the idea of a world museum, not the beginning as the British Museum would have intended it to have been at the time. Uh, for example, there's a very active group on Twitter, which is called um, uh, a history of a hundred cultures in one object. And it's trying to break down and decolonize the idea of a museum such as the British Museum and arguably something like the Chow Chak Wing Museum as well. So what is interesting is that with podcasting, um, taking outside of professional broadcasting, you now have a chance to actually deconstruct and reconsider some of these archaeological concepts in new and different ways. And I'm not going to recommend any particular uh, archaeology or museum based podcast, apart from my own, no. Um, uh, but what is interesting is seeing the way that the heritage sector, the museum sector is beginning to think of podcasting as a means of reaching an audience as well. And it is an extension of broadcasting radio. One of the key things too is that, you know, archaeology is an academic discipline. You can argue when archaeology began. Um, I tend to think of it as being a construct of the 1860s and 1870s when you get the creation of formal uh, professional archaeological positions within a number of European universities. But obviously the exploitation of uh, heritage from Egypt in particular and various parts of the then Ottoman Empire was beginning much earlier. You have, of course, excavations in Pompeii from the 1750s onwards. Some would argue that archaeology as we know it is a post-World War II construct in terms of the scientific discipline, and some would argue that we are still looters as well. So you could really take your pick, but one of the interesting thing is that it's uh, the idea of excavating old things to learn about old cultures has been around for several centuries. And the way that news is presented in general, of course, has changed considerably. I put this up more as a factoid than any particular reference to what we're talking about today, um, just because only two weeks ago we had the bicentennial of the death of Napoleon Bonaparte. And purely by coincidence, 
The Manchester Guardian, which of course has evolved and changed to be The Guardian today, published their very first issue on exactly the same day that Napoleon died. And in an era of social media, in an era of 24-hour news channels, what is worthwhile bearing in mind that only 200 years ago, it took more than two months for the news that the death of the most famous man on the planet to actually reach the masses. So it's been a quite a remarkable progression just in terms of the way that we relate to engagement with news and associated with that is the way that archeological news is announced, discoveries are performed and announced. Print media and archeology span in the 19th century were actually made for each other. Because as I said, in a pre-television era, when you have a whole lot of visual resources, you know, material culture and artifacts that have been recovered from archeological excavations, uh, uh, those publications that turned to uh, using images first were the ones that were really being picked up and, and, and being used quite creatively by both archaeologists. And that, that sympathetic relationship between uh, you know, more and more digs so that we can publicise them it really takes place in the mid 19th century and in the English speaking world, largely as a result of the illustrated London news. That whether it was photography in the early 20th century or lithographic line illustrations of the 19th century, all of the major archaeological discoveries of the era were being reported quite breathlessly within the Illustrated London News. And this was the way that most Britons, certainly Londoners, were receiving information about new discoveries. This was good in one way, in terms of it was presenting these finds in a relatively sober manner, but it was also perpetuating many of the tropes that archaeology still has to deal with in the 21st century and many of the colonial legacies as well. The first thing, of course, is you have the idea of the archaeologist and the expert could only come from Europe, preferably from Britain, more importantly, only from Oxford or Cambridge, um, that locals had no, no agency whatsoever over their own history or over their own past. And indeed, not only do they have no agency over it, we don't trust them to look after it. The only way that we can preserve these cultures is to put them on a crate and bring them back to the British Museum. In some cases, the objects they were finding were so large they didn't even fit through the door of the British Museum. Um, the other thing was, of course, the romanticism, the exotic travel, the uh, far off destinations, um, and again, that relationship between the scientific researchers of which archaeologists would have been considered were the first groups to go into the new areas as they were becoming colonised and being brought into the British Empire as well. So it becomes, again, a cyclical relationship that the news needs these stories to represent the spread of civilization over the, the areas that have been colonized. And at the same time, archeologists needed this support to garner financial support and funding and on and on it went. But in many ways, things change in the early 1920s, in the early 20th century. Howard Carter's discovery of Tutankhamun's tomb in November of 1922, not only changed archeology span in many ways, but it changed the way that the general public thought about archeology. span And this was because of the sensational news reporting of the 1920s. And more importantly, a decision that was made by Howard Carter, which probably influenced the way the 20th century would engage with uh, news reporting of archeology span in more ways than we would have considered possible. Arthur Merton, who in this illustration is the gentleman on the left-hand side, was the Egyptian correspondent for the Times newspaper of London. And he had been in Egypt for quite some time before Carter's discovery. They actually knew each other relatively well. He would report on major Egyptology news, but his main uh, role within Egypt was reporting of contemporary colonial affairs and British involvement with Egyptian government, um, a large part of his job was reporting business opportunities. But of course, with the discovery of Tutankhamun, Howard Carter realized he wanted to actually try and control the news feed, probably the first archeologist to consider this idea of public relations. And he actually approached Merton with the concept of resigning from the times and becoming the press agent of the excavations. Um, Merton refused to uh, resign from the times, but what they ended up doing was signing an exclusive contracts whereby the Times would receive uh, 
exclusive news and first reporting before all of the other newspapers. And so most of the official reporting of the slow process of uh, recording or revealing recording and then removing from the tomb the various uh, grave goods buried with Tutankhamun was covered by the Times first and then picked up by other news agencies independently. One voice, one narrative, the invention of the modern PR system, at least from a historical perspective. The downside was that around Cairo, there were journalists from around the globe sitting in uh, hotels waiting for any snippet of news and any bits of rumour. And I'm not in any ways means or, uh, 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 yeah, in, 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 I'm not in any way suggesting that the mummy curse story originates in this particular context, but the perpetuation of the mummy curse story can be traced back to this very occurrence. Because what you actually have is a whole lot of journalists with no news to report, they've been locked out of any official announcements, and so they're picking up on any rumours and innuendos. Mummy myths uh, and mummy curse myths have been around for some time at this point in time, but what you actually have is an American newspaper reporting as truth that supposedly on the walls of the coffin, or on the walls of the tomb, was an inscription in hieroglyphs saying, Death comes on swift wings to he who enters here. There is, of course, no such thing. But this has remained one of the most famous archaeological finds of the 20th century, this inscription that never existed. And so the downside of controlling the narrative was that you couldn't control the counter narrative. And in many ways, it is from that that you end up with the hunt from Atlantis and the Megan Fox TV show. A few things happen in between, but yeah, conceptually. Um, just in terms of this relationship with the Times, by the way, it's interesting that it continues in many, many ways, uh, uh, well after the death of Carter and Lord Carnarvon, the financier of the uh, excavation. Um, uh, Lord Carnarvon, of course, had a whole range of uh, Egyptian antiquities that he had uh, permission to take from Egypt back to Britain, back to his manor house, High Clear. Um, those of you who are fans of uh, uh, period drama TV will, of course, know High Clear as Downton Abbey. Um, and, and indeed, actually had this quite significant collection of antiquities. Now, when Lord Carnarvon, the fifth Lord Carnarvon, died in 1922 in Egypt, helping to perpetuate the mummy curse myth, I should add. Um, what had happened was his son, who had no Egyptian Egyptology whatsoever, locked this collection away and it was promptly forgotten about until 1988, when the Times published the exclusive announcement that cleaning through, cleaning through the cupboards, cleaning through the attics, was this uh, trove of Egyptian antiquities, which of course is now on display in High Clear um, in a post-COVID world when we're allowed to travel again, you can go and visit it. Um, and indeed the only room, one of the only public rooms of the house that the Downton Abbey film crew could never film in because there was no way you could work the narrative of ancient Egypt and these an Egyptian antiquities into that particular TV drama. But again, it was the times who broke the story. One of the other interesting things, of course, is that in the 21st century, not just with podcasts, but the way that archaeologists engage with social media has really revolutionised the way that we can think about um, presenting our findings and revealing stories. Again, trying, like Howard Carter, to control some degree of the narrative. Um, I'm going to give you an example of someone, an organisation that's done it incredibly well over the past couple of years, um, and yet with a caveat of even controlling it, things cannot necessarily go the way that you want to. The first thing is uh, 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 Pompeii, of course, is the most famous archaeological site in the Mediterranean. We all know it. Probably many of us in this room have been and visited the site. But Pompeii was in a real mess about 20 years ago, in danger of being added to the World Heritage List of Endangered Sites. Um, a number of buildings were collapsing. Financial resources were depleted. A lot of the restoration work that took place in the 1950s, which was made with dodgy concrete, mafia supplied, was collapsing. There are all sorts of issues. In the middle of the last decade, the Italian government underwent a whole restructure, uh, not just with Pompeii, but more broadly with culture and heritage. One of the things that has happened is that Pompeii is now under the umbrella of a larger organisation, the Archaeological Park. One of the key things that this new rebranding and conceptualization of the administration of Pompeii has been the way that they've reached out on social media 
Uh, and in particular, the way that they've used their website to do press releases. Now, coincidentally, this has also coincided since 2017 with new excavations in a part of Pompeii called Regio 5, uh, led by uh, Massimo Asana, who's just about to step down as the director of the Pompeii excavations. But what is interesting is that both uh, Asana himself for his own social media uh, channels, and then for the official Pompeian channels, have been able to really direct any announcements of new finds, new research. And it's really been a textbook case for the rest of us in terms of how we can use this opportunity to get people invested in our project and our research. Here's a site that's beloved by the globe. Here's a site that, you know, a large number of the tourists have had the opportunity to visit in a pre-COVID era. Here is a great way to keep them engaged with what is happening well after their visit. It's really a textbook example in how social media could be used for public engagement for heritage and archaeology. But even then, one of the key issues is that you can control the narrative to a certain point. And whilst it's great to rush release news of new findings, archaeology is a long and slow process. And this was a frustration that many of the journalists had at the time of Howard Carter. What have you found, Howard? What have you found? What's going to take us months, indeed years in that case, to reveal information? And particularly if you add on the peer review process, it can take a very long time. Archaeologists are also notoriously slow publishers, and I put my hand up and say I'm as guilty as anyone else. But what is interesting is this dichotomy between presenting initial thoughts and observations of material as it's coming out of the ground, and then the actual finds after that long so process of peer-reviewed scientific forensic investigation because that initial narrative can often be very different to the final interpretation and the big problem is that the general public are going to grasp onto that initial narrative so some of you may remember from 2018 the discovery there's asana looking pensively down as uh, if you've ever directed an archaeological dig, the media wants you to look in one of two poses. One is looking at your find, scratching your chin, going, what is it? The other is looking middle distance out that one day I could excavate all this as well. So uh, there's, there's a couple of set tropes just in archaeological photography. But uh, in the middle of 20, 2018, the team uh, working in Regio 5 discovered this remarkable skeleton underneath with the head underneath a massive stone block. And of course, it did not take long, despite a relatively sober press release, for the media to pick up on the man who's gone down as Pompey's unluckiest man, or history's unluckiest man, or the unluckiest guy in history. Suddenly, the narrative could no longer be controlled. And of course, the, 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 the message that you'll see, you know, for example, in CNN's tweet up the top, a 30-year-old man who, well, A, how do we know he's 30? His bones have yet to be excavated from the ground, let alone undergo forensic investigation. But um, um, the, uh, the concept of, uh, uh, you know, during the eruption of Pompeii, he's running along, and then this boulder crushes him to death. And it's like, oh, if only he could step that, you know, half a meter that way, he would have lived and all sorts of things. So the, the narrative went off. And of course, what's interesting was that, you know, then there were coins. So he was running, maybe he'd stolen money, you know, opportunistic um, in the leather pouch. And then, you know, the initial, uh, the, in, the initial skeletal uh, structure was, oh, okay, well then actually maybe you had a limp or a broken bone and that's why it was too slow. And, you know, there was, there was a, a frenzied media speculation over a period of about a week. And then what you actually have is that seven days later, the Pompeii uh, officials actually announce, well, turns out, actually, he hasn't been crushed to death by the rock because there's his head and his skull. And sorry, I should have uh, warned you, I was going to show some images of human remains, but I do apologize. So um, um, and, and indeed, the interpretation is actually far more complex, far more nuanced, and actually in many ways far more interesting than the guy being crushed to death by a stone. What appears to be the case is he has actually died during the eruption, that the debris has fallen at a later stage, and what you've actually had is some degree of subsistence, or subsidence rather, I should say, underneath, and that he's body has actually fallen, but he was not killed by the rock. Um, and as you can see, his skull was certainly not crushed by the stone. 
But what is interesting, because of that week of the unluckiest guy in history, if you jump online now, you will still see that as the main takeaway from this particular excavation. So perhaps they would have been better off waiting another month before reporting. But nonetheless, it was a new story that captured the world's imagination. Another slightly different perspective is that often, and again, this is not unique to archaeology. This is common to any science, any social science, any type of investigation, that no matter how well written your press release is, the nuanced details of your four-year scientific study into such and such gets reduced to a couple of common memes within the media. The cure for cancer, the, the pill that will make you last longer, um, and so on. So this is some really interesting research fun, done by Roman archaeologist and historian Stephen Tuck of Miami University. Um, basically, he created a massive database. How many people died at Pompeii? We don't know. What happened to the refugees from Pompeii? We don't know. So what he did was to create a massive database to see if any of the names that we knew from Pompeii appeared in later Roman historical records and other centres. And this incredible, you know, decade-long research found that refugees from the Pompeii eruptions ended up rebuilding lives quite successfully in some cases in a whole range of different areas around the Bay of Naples and even as far north as Ostia. A really interesting narrative in terms of a Roman historical studies more generally, but also in terms of what happens to people after a disaster. And I'm not going to mention the name of the newspaper. You'll be able to imagine which one it is. Um, took that narrative of refugees and twisted it ever so slightly in a contemporary debate about refugee rights. The Pompeii crisis caused an ancient refugee crisis. Romans embarked on public works project to cope with the sudden influx of survivors. We needed Brexit to stop the Romans from coming to Rome. Um, so again, a nuanced historical narrative in a news media organization, particularly one that has a political gender one way or another, could twist that story ever so slightly. As I say, of course, we all know it's not common to archaeology, but it's a really interesting perspective. My own example of this, albeit in a much smaller scaled version, and the only time you'll ever see my name in Broadway, uh, was uh, our 2015 PR announcement of uh, that season's work in Paphos of the ancient theatre and surrounding environments. And for whatever reason, you, know, you put out a very similar press release each year at the end of each season. Sometimes it gets picked up, sometimes it doesn't. For, two, for, for some reason, 2015, we got picked up all over the place. Um, supposedly, uh, I'm interviewed in Icelandic somewhere, but I've never actually had the chance to hunt that one down. But uh, uh, Playbill, and this was actually one of the tamer ones, but I just put it because of the novelty of the only time I'll ever be on Broadway. Uh, Playbill published, of course, that we had unearthed a theatre. 20 years after we had unearthed the theater. So again, you know, it's a, it's a, much, uh, a much lower scale, but nonetheless an example of how, no matter how well crafted the press release, ultimately the journalists will cherry pick a particular aspect of the story. So what I wanna do in our remaining 10 minutes is just to kind of give you a rundown on some of the things that have been happening in the world of archeology span in the last month, um, just as I would have done on the radio program um, to, to give a summary. I'm always conscious when I do this that I don't want to fall into the same trap that the journalists have done, which is by underrepresenting the story. Um, I'm aware of two, at least, stories that I have done that with. Um, but what I've tried to do is to both take a reporting of the story from a reputable, reputable media organization and where possible to go back to the original publication um, just to sort of see if there are any narratives. But it is an interesting challenge. How do you dissect a really complex news story from nature and get it down into a two or three minute segment? Is it possible? And you can understand why journalists who are not trained in a science or in a, a social science or trained in archeology span in this case, do get it wrong. So some of the things, and actually, sorry, just before I talk about some of the things in May, it's also interesting that at the beginning of the COVID crisis last year, uh, Rihanna and I spoke on the telephone and said, oh, we might need to rethink the news segment because of course, oh, at that point in time in March last year, every site on the planet closed down. Um, you know, all the plans for the European summer excavations were suddenly canceled. 
you know, all over the globe, archaeology wasn't happening. And I suddenly, I said to her, look, I, I actually suspect we might need to rethink the news segment because the, the amount of reporting of news is going to drop off. And of course, what's happened is that in various parts of the world, archaeological projects have been able to progress under different conditions. Um, uh, Egypt, for example, was the first uh, country to proclaim that they could, could actually uh, institute a COVID safe work site on an archaeological site. To this day, I have no idea how they've done it in terms of paperwork, um, particularly if you look at the uh, announcement late last year of the, uh, the deep pit graves from Saqqara, how on earth you could actually socially distance within an Egyptian tomb. I have no idea. You can't do it in a TARDIS in the ABC studio, so how do you do it in an Egyptian tomb? But nonetheless, some excavations have taken place. But more importantly, of course, the publication of results and of finds has progressed as normal. And indeed, many projects have taken the opportunity to catch up on publication. So ironically, the news stories have actually increased because of COVID, not decreased, which is not something I would have predicted 18 months ago. But what has taken place in the news? Well, at the beginning of the month, there was quite a fair bit of announcement or quite a fair bit of uh, uh, discussion around the announcement that the uh, Italian heritage authorities we're going to renovate the Colosseum. Now, I read quite recently that over COVID, Australians have spent $1 billion on house renovations. Uh, this is kind of like, um, <laughs> this is kind of like the block on steroids. Um, but the idea is that by the end of 2023, tourists to the Colosseum in Rome, and again, think of this within the structure of post-COVID economic recovery being led by tourism, one of the most important industries in Italy, full stop. But the idea is to give visitors a gladiator's point of view. And that's literally what it says in the press release as well. Now, what a gladiator's point of view is, is arguable, um, probably face down in the dirt, actually. But uh, what is interesting is that this is a very, very high-tech solution to getting more and more visitors onto the site. The idea is also that the, uh, the project, uh, an 18.5 million euro project, um, uh, contracted to a Milan-based firm, the floor will be light, reversible and sustainable. So the concept is it can be lifted when required for conservation and other research purposes, but placed down there for tourism purposes. And I suspect that we are, again, COVID restrictions depending, probably only a few years away from seeing concerts taking place in the Colosseum which is kind of a, a 21st century version of what it was designed to be, a place for spectacle and entertainment, but that fine balance between preserving heritage, maintaining heritage, and also making heritage usable, which is a, a much broader debate than I can cover here or that I could cover on the radio, um, but is a, a really interesting example of, of, of potentially how a site might be used in such a way. So of course, what's interesting was that, that media around the globe who picked up on this story, um, great chance to bring out your gladita gladiatorial tropes. Uh, I saw a couple of images of Russell Crowe as it used to look 20 years ago, popping up in various news sites and so on. But the actual story is not so much about the Colosseum, the actual story is about how do we maintain heritage and particularly how do we safely reopen tourist sites in a COVID era? One uh, story that uh, if we were doing a, a news segment on the Can You Dig It program on the radio uh, this month, I definitely would have done this one. Also in large part because here in Australia, the news reporting was led by the ABC. Um, but mention the word poo and you're going to go on the radio immediately anyway. Um, and indeed, if you want your press release to be picked up for any type of scientific research, there's a couple of keywords you need to drop in there. In my world, it's Cleopatra. Uh, Stonehenge is a big one, and I've got Stonehenge coming up, by the way. Uh, Neanderthals tend to get a pretty high pickup. Um, and again, if you can associate your research in any way, shape or form with a famous person, particularly a famous person who's been portrayed by a famous actor in a famous movie, tick, tick, tick. So it's kind of interesting, some of the tropes, but yes, poo always works. And what's interesting about this one, and I apologize to anyone watching on Zoom who's having uh, afternoon tea or a late lunch, I might actually go to that image instead. Um, but what is interesting about this particular research and indeed why it's been picked up by the media, it's a, a report in Nature 
that's come out this week, the, the famous scientific journal Nature, which has analysed uh, gut bugs. The, the, the poo that the ABC used is actually Viking poo uh, from York. And if you, I won't go back to it, but if you have a look at the size of it, that Viking really, he would have been reading the newspaper for some time. Um, but what's interesting is the actual research is not about any particular coprolites in their own right. It's about a broader understanding of uh, microbial DNA from human feces or fecal matter that has survived from 1,000 to 2,000 years ago, comparing that with microbial genomes for modern sampling from Western and developing countries today. Now, those of you who had the good privilege of hearing Keith Dobney, Professor Keith Dobney's talk in this room on Thursday night, and it will be online on Monday, if you haven't, um, will uh, know that uh, one of the big revolutions in terms of archeological science in the past decade has been this concept of trying to understand microbiome research. I don't understand it, I'm not a scientist, but what I do know is that this is an opportunity to actually understand changes in human dietary patterns and changes in uh, disease and other relationships with diet as well. One of the really interesting things that the big picture thinking that Keith presented in his talk was this idea that we can actually now begin to understand long-term trends in human health and development as well. And so a study such as this actually has really exciting implications for modern health and modern well-being, not just as a historical curiosity. So it would have been a good news story to, to do, and indeed we may end up doing it in future, um, simply because of that sense that archaeology is not just about studying the past, it's about learning from the past for the future as well. Another one, as I said before, Neanderthals is a phrase that always is popular, but uh, 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 Roman Neanderthals in particular, because then I get the, the double whammy of two words into a news headline story. Um, but this is reporting from uh, the 9th of May um, of Italian archaeologists um, recovering the remains of nine Neanderthal humans in a series of caves about 100 kilometres southeast of Rome. So they're not really Roman. They're in the vague neighborhood. Um, but what you've got is uh, uh, investigations of uh, human remains in the period approximately around about 50 to 68,000 years ago. And what appears to be the case is that these humans have died, or these Neanderthal humans have died in another location, and parts of their bodies have been dragged by hyenas into this cave. So a lot of really interesting implications that will come out of this research. Again, it's uh, really interesting um, uh, research. The cave itself has actually been known since the 1930s, um, but this is a new set of investigations and more significantly a new set of um, publication of the investigation. So it's also really interesting because it, it, it's part of a much broader trend in terms of trying to change the narrative about hominids and Neanderthal in particular. Repatriation is one of those news stories which every month there's probably something I can refer to. Um, this one's actually from a little bit earlier, this particular uh, uh, news article, but I, I've just put it in because it's a really easy one to talk about and to talk about briefly. Um, but of course, here in Australia, you will be conscious of ongoing and very complex debates about the calls for repatriation of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander materials from museum collections uh, overseas. Um, you may be aware of some news story pertinent to some objects from here within the Sydney area, and there will be some more news on that in the very near future. But what is interesting is that after years of both Indigenous people, not just here in Australia, but around the globe, and the cultural heritage sector trying to convince everybody that repatriation is actually a good thing, what you actually now have in many ways, it's a scenario where the media is the ones pushing for repatriation. Oh, this museum should return these objects and, and kind of leading the narrative to some degree. And what's actually fascinating is seeing the way that many, many indigenous cultures and individuals have taken on a far more nuanced and actually a far more interesting approach, which is let's discuss with the European institution about permanent loan or long-term loan or our elders being able to go and access it in Cambridge or wherever the case may be, in the United States 
to get a more nuanced understanding. So there's a lot of big issues, and again, far too broad for here, far too broad for a short segment on the radio, but I will just show this one. Um, the fact that Boris Johnson decided to use his first ever interview with a Greek language newspaper to declare that the Parthenon marbles would never be returned to Greece was both a political statement on his part, but also a really interesting example of how the culture war is going in Britain in particular. There's a variation of the culture war here in Australia, of course, but, uh, but it's getting particularly nasty in Britain. And that will be the last news story that I'm gonna refer to in this, this presentation this afternoon. But the kicker in that story was that, um, you know, again, this has been tied up with the Brexit project and, and much larger issues of British identity. Um, and again, the concept that the British Museum should be a, a, a world heritage museum rather than a, a, a smaller um, focused specialized study area. But the kicker in the story was that the French government have announced the repatriation of the Parthenon marbles that are currently held within the Louvre collection. And in return, the Greek government are going to be loaning rare bronzes to the Louvre for an exhibition in future. So this contrast between the standoff relationship between two governments and a collaborative relationship, which is showing positive results. And there's a real lesson in us, all of us, for that sense of the 21st century does need to be about collaboration. CERN Abbas and the CERN Abbas giant. Now this is a new story which I have covered on Can You Dig It four different times. And I'm keen to get back to it because this is the uh, most recent investigation and the announcements that came out um, and publicized by the BBC and by other media um, only uh, two weeks ago. Now uh, the CERN Abbas giant is a giant figure as you can see um, carved into the limestone chalk in Dorset, um, massive in size. And what you have had is a argument over the last two decades as to when it was actually created. Is this a prehistoric piece of work or is it a fanciful creation of the 17th century? And there have been compelling reasons to suggest both. Um, there was also a counter argument as well that no, it must be Celtic and around about the same time of, of the Roman occupation of Britain and he was a chance to actually yeah, nick off Romans. Um, but what you've got, and sorry, I, I don't have any images to share with you, but there are a number on the BBC website. The, uh, uh, a team of researchers um, did actually uh, excavate and take soil samples from both the elbows, so both there and two of the feet. Um, in March last year, of course, all of the results were delayed because of coronavirus, like everyone else. But uh, the results coming back with a dating that they actually are Anglo-Saxon or early medieval, which is contrary to absolutely every opinion to what these limestone figures that are seen in Wiltshire and other parts of the United Kingdom um, date to. So that has sent um, not just British prehistorians into a whirlpool of what, but actually British medievalists also going, what? <laughs> and suddenly I've got to become an expert in giants, limestone carved giants as well. So the, this one will play out more in future, but the application of scientific analysis to a well-known site is a really, really lovely story. And then the last one I'm going to finish on is not so lovely, but in many ways a clarion call. And one of the things that can you dig it and other media outreach can be used for in a useful way is uh, the announcement two days ago that the archeology span department at the University of Sheffield is likely to be closed down. Now, Sheffield is regarded within our sector as one of the finest universities, uh, departments of teaching and particularly teaching uh, archeozoology um, within the English speaking world. Generations of amazing researchers have come from that institution and uh, an online petition managed to get 20,000 signatures in less than 24 hours. Now getting 20,000 archeologists to agree on anything is impossible. So it does show you just how outraged the sector is. Um, like Australia, within Britain, within the United States, within Europe, there is a big debate about the costs of museum departments and, and the cost of university departments. Um, arguably, this is part of that broader culture war that Boris Johnson's government is waging for better or for worse. But 
In terms of the way that the researchers and the British archaeology community have decided to engage the public, this story that came out yesterday is a really interesting approach because you could take the approach of, oh, no, the government's closing down a department, rah, 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 let's take to the barricades, all that sort of stuff. No, instead, it's actually about associating what the department does with real world experiences. And not only real world experiences, but let us associate the University of Sheffield's archaeology team with the most famous archaeological site in Britain. You close down this department, you lose any chance to do more meaningful zoological investigations in terms of the, the way people engage with Stonehenge and what they ate at the time. Whether the campaign will be successful or not, I don't know. I encourage anyone in this room and anyone listening who cares passionately about archaeology and about heritage to jump online and to sign the petition. If Sheffield goes, any university can cut any archaeology department anywhere in the world. Um, so it is a turning point in many ways for us as a community. And I don't want to end on a downer, even though I am ending on a downer, but what will be interesting in the next couple of weeks is seeing how the media plays out that story. And I think this is very, very clever news reporting. So I want to say thank you for anyone who does listen to the program or would like to listen to the program in future. I thank you. Always open for story ideas. So please feel free to let me know. From an Australian perspective, I would argue that um, archaeology does do me does do radio quite well and we do do print media relatively well but where we are failing is with television media and in particular commercial television media and I personally desperately think that Australia needs some version of time team doesn't need to be time team but some way of actually presenting the really dynamic and really exciting and culturally engaged stories to give Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders a chance to present their version of the archaeological evidence, not the Samoa Mortimer Wheeler, not the Craig Barker version, but a much more consistent and balanced version as well. Because there is actually no reason why Australians won't engage with our stories in the way that Britain's, you know, at one point, Time Team was getting 18 million viewers. There is no reason we can't get that same degree of interest as well. But in the meantime, I've got this little radio segment. I'm going to do the very best I can. Happy National Archaeology Week, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me. And uh, please enjoy uh, the Chow Chak Wing Museum this afternoon. And I should actually just very quickly give a plug. Um, Dr. Louise Pryke has just recently published a book on turtles and uh, the role of turtles in world culture. Louise is fantastic. I've had Louise on the program to talk about uh, Gilgamesh. Um, she is one of Australia's most in significant up and coming young scholars. And um, uh, she is giving a talk tomorrow afternoon at two o'clock in this room for World Turtle Day. So I hope you can join Louise as well. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs>